hormones, what are they? Why do we need them and how do we take care of them? Problems with hormonal balance tonight on call with the Prairie Doc. On call with the Prairie Doc is very important to a lot of people uh, in this area and in this region because it communicates a lot of very valuable information on health care, medical issues, uh, answers specific questions. The, this project takes dollars. We have people in studios and we have people that have to be paid and we have to do production costs even though Dr. Holmes' time, our time, the guest time is all donated, we still have production costs. We have a great foundation called the Healing Words Foundation that oversees this whole operation and is responsible for some of the fundraising to promote these programs. If you like this program and you enjoy the information you're getting and you find it's valuable, please feel free to go to our website and donate. We would really like to have some additional financial support and it's very simple to do and again it'll keep this program going for the foreseeable future. So the website is prairiedoc.org, O-R-G, prairiedoc.org. Go there, donate if you're so inclined and we thank you very much. Good evening and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. You've probably heard of thyroid, pancreas, adrenal, pituitary glands, but what do they do? And what are the functions of hormones in our bodies? First, let's take a look at this week's Prairie Doc quiz question. It's kind of complicated. Listen here carefully, multiple choice. The pancreas has two functions. One, make digestive juices. Two, make hormones like insulin. Three, distribute cortisone to joints. Four, number one and three. Five, number one and two. Six, all of the above. Viewers who call in the correct answer will be entered into a drawing to win a signed copy of our book, The Picture of Health. Each of my essays originally written for this show comes with a wonderful accompanying photograph by Dr. Judith Peterson. We will announce the answer and the winner at the end of the show. Remember, you only have 10 minutes to get your answer in. We answer your medical questions about hormones or your comments about hormones as they are called in or sent to us via Facebook or email. Call in questions to 1-888-376-6225 or send us an email to the address on the screen. Joining us tonight is endocrinologist Dr. Mark Oppenheimer of Oppenheimer Endocrinology in Sioux Falls. Thank you for joining us, Mark. The answer is number, is number seven. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not, 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 we'll, we'll, we'll talk oh, I wasn't, about it. Oh, I wasn't supposed to give no, it away. Shh. <laughs> so, an endocrinologist. Uh, what the heck is an endocrinologist? I Great. Mean, what, what is the endocrine system? The endocrine system is when once, if an organ sends a message out into the bloodstream, it's taken out by another organ and things happen. So it's a bloodstream message yeah. and that's sent by a hormone in the blood. Correct. No, uh, but there's no, uh, there's, no there's no tubes. There's no exocrine function. There is no uh, glandular, well, there's a, it's a gland, but yeah. it's by the blood. Yeah, via the blood. Right. So what are examples of endocrine organs? Well, one of my favorites is the thyroid. I love the thyroid. <laughs> Thyroid's located at the base of the neck, and um, and if you and the best way to explain what it does is to look at the extremes. If someone is underactive thyroid, they start feeling cold. They're they're tired. Uh, they uh, they have constipation. Uh, uh, their pulse may go down. They may gain a pound or two, not much more than that. And then their metabolism turns down. Yeah, yeah, and so and if they're overactive. They start going like going crazy. They're, they're, um, they can go crazy, but uh, they, they get tremors and they can lose weight and their heart rate can go up to well over 100 and they feel hot all the time and they're hungry all the time, but they're still losing weight. And what you want is you want to be in between. Right, you want to be balanced, don't you? Yeah. And that's what the endocrine system is all about, balance. Exactly. Homeostasis. What's the word homeostasis? 
uh, that's balance, I suppose. I suppose. So you know the big words. What? Homeostasis. I don't use big words. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. But the interesting thing about the thyroid is it isn't just the thyroid that's controlling this. What else? Well, if you, what happens is that you think of the, of the thyroid as the body's furnace. It makes two hormones, which, I'm gonna, which are called T4 and T3, the difference being the number of iodine groups on this chemical. And those are, those are sensed by a gland in the, in the base of the brain called the pituitary, which I call, if you call the, the thyroid the furnace, it's the thermostat. So it sees how much of the T4 and T3 are in the bloodstream, and then sends a message back called TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. And so you can see by the different patterns of the, of the thyroid levels and the TSHs, whether it's your underactive, overactive, and what, what, the, what the cause of it is. So let's say I have a Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is this immune system, my, my body mm -hmm. has destroyed my thyroid because whatever reason. But yeah. the, the thyroid is sick. It's kind of sick. Getting burned out. It's burned out. And so your, your, your thermostat says, Oh, we need more. We mean we need more T3 and T4. Correct. So what happened? The TSH goes up. The T4 and free, and free T3 are low, and it's easily diagnosed and easily treated. And how do you treat it? Well, I, I treat it. I'm a standard do doctor. I, I don't believe in all these fads. Um, I don't believe in in, des in armor thyroid, which is basically a dried up th uh, animal thyroid. I believe in synthetic thyroid replacement. Uh, it's, uh, the brand name is Synthroid. It is available very inexpensively as, as a generic. Levothyroxine. Levothyroxine. The problem with the generic is there are five different companies that make the generics, and they're not equivalent. So you generally do the brand name Synthroid? If people, keep, if people can afford 35 bucks a month, I use the brand name. Okay. If, they, if it's getting food on the table, I'll use generic. Okay. But every time, but if if people, this is people's lives, and every time the, ph the pharmacists have permission to change from one generic to another generic whenever they feel like it, that's perfectly legal, and uh, they believe that I'm I'm full of it, that that they're that the generic is just as good as the brand name, but there's lots in the literature that says I'm not full of it, right. And so I try and use brand name for, for replacement. For, for, for thyroid replacement. For thyroid replacement. And, there, and some people, oh, I'm still tired. I'm still tired. I'm on thyroid replacement. My, my TSH was 6, which is minimally elevated. Oh, we can make you feel better if I give you thyroid replacement. Not, it's not going to do it. Not going to do it. They're tired because they're not walking or something. Or Exactly. Or they didn't sleep well, or they're whatever. There are lots they of sleep apnea, or there's another illness. Exactly. So they're, uh, or they may have some depression. God forbid. I mean, there are things you can't diagnose depression by a blood test. No, but that's interesting. So the TSH goes up when the thyroid is low because yeah. it's trying to kick the thyroid into action. Exactly. And so it really is. TSH is the best monitor for thyroid disease. Uh, yes and no. Okay. Because? Because you can be faked out. All right. And so this is where you need, where the experience comes in. You can have a normal TSH and be hypothyroid okay. because your pituitary may be not working. So the problem may not be the thyroid. The problem might be the pituitary. Correct. You could have a pituitary tumor, and so, th so, that, the, so that you could, ha so you could have a, a low T4, low, t low T3, the TSH may be one, which is or 0.5, which is perfectly normal, but the person can be totally underactive and totally screwed up because of a pituitary problem, not a thyroid problem. So it's a complicated picture, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, what I do is hard. Yes, I tell you, I tell you. So let me ask you this: Who was it that developed the TSH assay and who learned about T4 and T3? I mean, who? Some guy in the past. Who was that guy? Well, actually, it wasn't a guy. The, the person who, who, who found the assay was a gal named Rosalind Yallow okay. out of New York City. Now, it just so happens that back in the early 19, in the late 50s and early 60s, the average replacement dose for thyroid was roughly 0.3 to 0.5. And there was this young Which whippersnapper. Which is double what we're doing yeah, now. Yeah, there was this young whippersnapper out of New York who really thought he knew everything. Yeah. That was my dad. Yeah. And he used the assay that developed by, by the other people to help show how to properly replace that. So he, he's really kind of famous. He's really yeah. famous. Yeah. 
Yeah, so that's your dad. That's my dad. That's neat. So, uh, but an assay is what? It's a test. It's, it's a just, test. It's just a test. It's just it's just a test. All right. So thyroid is very interesting. I mean, I, I uh, uh, to to bring a person's metabolism into normal range, very important. But some people think they have to have this thyroid extract that's made from dead animals and yeah. dried up and so on and so forth. Why is it? And how about some people think you need to have T3 replacement? Why is that? People grasp at straws. They, they, they're, they, they, first of all, they, they think that they know everything because it's on the internet, and everything on the internet is absolutely true. Uh, there are people who are placed on thyroid hormones who have totally normal thyroid function tests because the the, the doctor is trying to help them lose weight, things like that. Yeah. That's not a good idea. No, it? I mean there are complications from taking too much thyroid. Now, fortunately, the body is smarter than some of the doctors. And so instead, if you take too much T4, some of it can be, instead of broken down to T3, which is the active hormone, can go into reverse T3. This is complicated, but so you don't have to know that. Okay. Um, There's but, a test afterwards, by the way. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's, the, that's the answer seven. Okay. <laughs> but the answer is you've got to be careful about it. Yeah, do not... you've you got to listen to your doctor. You've got to look to your doctor in the eye and say, do you really think that this is the problem? No. There are many things that can look like thyroid disease that is not. And, and, and going back to the TSHs, you could have normal TSHs and be hyperthyroid, overactive thyroid, because the, you could have pituitary tumors that make TSH and make people overactive thyroid. So you have to be very careful with just using one test. Okay. Now, back to the pituitary, which is a little bit of an outcropping of the brain that yeah. is the master controller, the thermostat for mm -hmm. not only the thyroid but a lot of other things. Yeah. Somebody called in and said, why do doctors, uh, uh, no, I uh, said, um, we'd like to know how dangerous a five millimeter pituitary tumor uh, microadenoma is. Oh my God. No. <laughs> It's not that okay. Uh, the, they're, they're the, the way pituitary tumors are classified is be either big ones or small ones. Okay. Anything one centimeter or greater is called a macro. Ten millimeters. Yeah. Right. Ten, Ten millimeters. This one's five. Anything right. less than that is a, is, a, is a micro. Okay. So this is a microadenoma. It's a microadenoma. So what? If I, I see a lot of people with microadenomas, they come in to see me because everyone's freaking out. And the, what the endocrinologist does is they do hormonal testing to see whether or not there's too much or too little. Of thyroid of, and all of the other things that uh, are controlled it, by the pituitary. Exactly. And if, there, if everything is functioning okay, then the only other question is, is it, is it growing? Is it going to affect a person's vision if it gets real big? So you, you do the hormonal testing, you follow that over time, and then you, um, and you do periodic... Uh, uh, X-rays of the brain, of the of the pituitary, MRIs of the pituitary, and you see if it's growing. And but most mostly, you don't do anything. You do nothing. Great. I'm good at that. That's a, at not doing anything. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we have a, a woman from Ramona wonders why did the doctors measure your thyroid? It's, is it good that they should be at the higher end rather than the lower end of the results? Now there's measuring the thyroid. There's feeling the thyroid, which is a yeah. Palpable they're talking about the blood test. But they're tech she's talking about blood tests. And the answer is, if pe people, the normal range for a TSH is roughly 0.3 up to 5. Now, so the question is, what happens if you have a TSH of 6? Does that cause symptoms? No. In other words, the TSH is higher than normal, implying that the thyroid is low, that you're on a low thyroid condition. It's a borderline low is what you're saying. Correct. And there have been multiple studies and multiple people arguing back and forth because that's how academic patient, uh, doctors make their money. Um, and the answer is, if you don't have a, a significantly elevated TSH, I'd say 10, the odds of you being helped by medication is probably just about placebo. But people who have a 6, next time might have a 9, next time might have a 12. They might, over years. Um, or they might have a six and then go down to four. They might have a thyroiditis, an inflammation of the thyroid. Okay, so and that's, uh, to finish this, and then we're going to go to the roll-in, the thyroid can go too high, too, can make too much T4 and T3. Yeah. 
Why would it do that? I mean, now it, it, orneriness. Just darn ornery. That's it. Uh, and a lot of it's, uh, it can be familial, uh, it, but it just happens. I mean, and it, it is one of the things that's really nice. It's very, it's nicely treatable. Uh, you do, you should see an endocrinologist. There are three basic treatments for overactive thyroid. There's medications, which have a bunch of side effects, but are very commonly used in, in, in Japan and Germany. They're called anti-thyroid drugs. Right. Uh, one out of every 200 people can wipe out their immune system with that drug, so you need to be careful. Right. But it's commonly used in pregnancy. So, so medicine is one Medicine's kind. one. Surgery is two. So you remove part of the thyroid, not all of it? Most of it. Okay, most of it then. And, but I'm not a surgeon, so okay. I, I wouldn't know how much to take out. And the third one would be radioactive, radioactive iodine. Radioactive iodine, which is wonderful. Because you give them a an, an, uh, radioactive iodine and it goes right to the problem. Yeah. And over a several month period, the thyroid gets killed, and you replace them, and that's easy. Yeah. And, and as, while we're here, and then we're going to go... Uh, Where are we going? I, we're going to go right over here. <laughs> okay. while, we're, while we're here, people will sometimes have a hot nodule. I mean, uh -huh. it will be a hot nodule, and it, it might be even malignant. And you treat that with radio radioactive iodine? Well, I have to stop you, because you, you said something that was wrong. Okay. If so, first of all, hot, uh, the way what you're describing is the results of a thyroid scan. It's just a nuclear medicine test. Right. Uh, that that test is rarely done anymore. It's out, been outmoded for probably for 20 or 30 years. Okay. But if you have someone who has done this test, most cancers are cold. Don't take up the radioactivity, but most cold are not cancer. Hot are extremely rarely, cancer. rarely cancer. So if someone has a hot nodule and their thyroid function tests are normal, you leave them alone. Okay. So, and that's interesting that you said that most cancers are cold, but there's a lot of cold nodules that are not cancer. Correct. All right. Some of the new technologies are important in viewing and diagnosing problems with glands. When I first started radiology, it was um, a little bit simpler, and now um, more modalities have been developed. Uh, for instance, PET uh, came out several years ago and now it's fused with CT. You get the molecular information from the PET and the anatomical information from CT. When you consider uh, hormonal effect, um, organs come to mind like the pituitary, the thyroid, the pancreas, the adrenal glands. This is a example of the thyroid and the mainstay of imaging is ultrasound. Uh, this is uh, an image of the left lobe of the thyroid, and the cursors are marking a mass. You see the mass has a black center, and it's a little darker than the remaining gland. Well, the next image shows me a nuclear med study. This would be the left lobe. This would be the right lobe. Uh, normal shape, normal size. This study helps determine if normal thyroid activity, hypothyroid, or hyperthyroid. This is a cross-section through uh, the brain in the sagittal plane from front to back. And this, so here is the pituitary gland right here. It's pretty small. These syringes are really magnified. This is an MRI with intravenous contrast. That is the gold standard to look at the pituitary. Here's the pituitary, and normally it should enhance and look all white. And you can see on the, on the bottom of it here, these areas that are darker, that's a little adenoma. And those small little adenomas can do all kinds of hormonal things. This is an ultrasound exam of the abdomen, and uh, this is an image through the pancreas. It is difficult to see because of its lie and because of the organs around it, the duodenum is around it, and air is not a good thing with ultrasound. This image is a CT image, and here is the pancreas uh, on this image. And the tail lies higher or more cephalad than the, than the head, and so it's not in one plane. Uh, in the center image, uh, this is from the same CT, but this is called a coronal image, and I'm looking at the patient from front to back, and here is the pancreas here in the center of the screen. So ultrasound is a good, useful tool. In a lot of cases, look at the pancreas, but in some other cases, we don't see the entire gland with that, and then uh, MRI is kind of a problem solver for that. So this is an image of an MRI of the abdomen and we were looking at the pancreas because of a nodule we found on CT. So this bright 
white area is a small cystic area in the head of the pancreas and this little duct coming off it, it communicates with the pancreatic duct. And some of the concerns that somebody who has a, a CT every six months or so, and in a year they may have four or five CTs, but we, we were concerned about dose and we watched dose pretty closely. Thank you very much, Dr. Paulson. What a, what a beautiful illustrations of different kinds of modalities in looking at the body. Um, this is your show, and your questions are key to our show discussion, and you've called in a number of questions. Keep calling them in. Your questions are important for our discussion. Uh, call about hormonal health, make a comment, anything, 1-888-3766-6225 or send us an email to ask at prairiedoc.org. When you and I started, I started before you did, but when we started, uh, the, the x-ray and the MRI modalities were nothing like what we have now. And I think it's wonderful that we have those, but it has moved us from doing that careful exam that we used to do. What's your comment about that? You know, there are certain things that are hard to do. And I couldn't, I'm obviously an endocrinologist. I've been doing this for a very long time. I couldn't properly feel the thyroid until I was, vast, vast majority of my training was done. And because people are just not, not taught how to do the physical examination properly. And there are certain areas of medicine that are sexy, maybe a cardiologist, radiologist, the, the ones that, that are, are, are prominent, they save lives. Areas like endocrinology are typically ignored to a large degree in, in medical education so that people don't know how to feel the thyroid. And so then they, they, they mash their fingers, they do all sorts of wonderful things, but they don't know what they're doing. And so if you, if you, if you have a doctor who knows what they're doing, you may not need to do all these expensive modalities. And uh, the fingers can be very, very good. But those guys are getting older. <laughs> so, <laughs> so let's uh, dive into this, though. But thank you, Brad, for that wonderful illustration. South Dakota woman had been on 1.75 thyroid medicine when her new doctor dropped her down to 0 0.25. Would that make her gain weight? She's gained 27 pounds. She's had hypothyroidism since 1963. So uh, isn't that interesting? Well, what's your, your off, you, know, you don't know the whole story but do as well as you can from that comment. I'm really concerned. Uh, the, the, the dose that they're describing is 0 0.175. That's a lot. No, it not, depends how much someone weighs. Because okay. again, the, t the typical replacement dose is roughly 0 0.001 per pound. So if you're a 200 pounder, they're gonna, 0.175 is about, right. is about right. Now when you get older, you, the dose requirements typically go, go less. Go less. Mm -hmm. But uh, probably the, 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 the provider uh, saw that the thyroid was, was too high, and they, they, they cut. They dropped it to 0 0.25. That's crazy. Way down. That's too crazy. Bad. Should have been a slower drop. Yeah, well, it depends what the numbers look like. But uh, if the numbers were at all reasonable, uh, then they should maybe drop to 150 micrograms. Right. But, you know, they probably. 1.5. Yeah, I do, whatever I do, I do it very slowly. But the point is that if you just check a TSH, like you were talking about before, mm -hmm. then you won't know how overactive they are because the TSH will be low. They'll yeah. be low with a free T4 of 1 or a free T4 of 5. Yeah. So that's why, especially if someone's on replacement, you may want to do the free T4 and the TSH. You just do it once a year, yeah. and it's cost effective. So, and I think also the point about going up on thyroid is got to be, you've got to be very careful because the classic story is that you, you go too fast on increasing the thyroid replacement and they'll, you'll instigate a, or uncover a heart attack. You, if someone is generally in reasonable health and, and reasonable age, you could start them at full replacement. The stuff about having to wait for a week or two and then increase and then increase, that's, that's, that's junk. Nope. You just put them on full replacement because what, ha what happens is thyroid synthroid has what's called a very long half-life. 
It's if you if you take you're taking your thyroid medication, you stop it altogether. After one week, half it will still be in your system. And so it's the same thing with accumulation. So that's why doctors tend to wait six weeks after any dose adjustment for checking blood work. My, and I would disagree in my whole practice. Well, you're wrong. I, <laughs> my whole practice has been to do it slowly, and that way I don't overshoot. And I think that's an important, and you don't know where they're going to be anyway. So that's been my I philosophy. know. You don't know. That's right. You are an endocrinologist. <laughs> okay. Um, a man from Sioux Falls asked, how does poor circulation affect the endocrine system? Now, that's interesting. You are the endocrinologist that covers the heart hospital, are yeah. you not? Yes. So you, you're involved with uh, people who have poor circulation in your practice. Yeah. How does it relate to the endocrine system? The, I would reflect back on what you were talking about uh, two minutes ago. If someone has an underactive thyroid, let's suppose someone comes into the heart hospital and it's uncovered that they they have very very underactive thyroid, and their TSH is high. Their TSH is a hundred. Right, so they're way up there. They 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 are, they are low 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 thyroid. Correct. And they've got heart disease. And they've got heart disease. They need heart surgery. And so then, I, and I've seen patients like this. And the correct answer is you let people do the surgery, and you're aware that the of the increased risk of difficulty getting off the respirator, the blowing machine right. afterwards. There's increased risk of, of, infa of infection, but if you try replacing those people, then you can then you can, in a, you can you could bring on a heart attack. Yeah. So if someone has known heart disease, if someone's elderly, that's when you start slow. Okay. Well, most of my patients need to be started slow. I'm just well, going to tell you that. <laughs> well, you got old patients. Yeah. So I have a question from. Um, uh, a woman from Sioux Falls uh, would like the doctors to explain Addison's disease. Oh, that's a fun topic. What is Addison's disease? It was named after? Addison. George Ad Addison or Fred Addison or somebody's Addison. I think his name was Jerry. Jerry Addison. I just made that up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what about Addison's disease? Addison's, one of the things, characteristics of, of endocrinology is that it's very much related to the immune system. And so when people, you people talk about Hashimoto's uh, and, and they look, check for anti-thyroid antibodies, the antibodies can be high, but if, but if the thyroid function tests are normal, you don't care, it doesn't cause symptoms. Right. So just like thyroid disease can be related to immune system, in the adrenal gland, it can be related to the immune system. And if you have, your, if, your thyroid, if your thyroid can fail, so can your adrenal gland. And that's and if the if the adrenal gland is what fails, it's called it's called Addison's disease. It's very very dramatic. Uh, people feel terrible. They're they're tired. They are going to have abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, weight loss, and people can die. Their their skin can can, can turn dark. And, um, and, and if you have adrenal insufficiency, you don't have the reserves to save yourself when you have an infection or you have yeah. a surgery or you, you get stressed in any way. You're a deep doo-doo. You're in trouble. So, uh, but it's not only the, the cortisol that you're last, you, you don't have aldosterone as well, so your electrolytes are out of whack as well, correct? Correct. correct. So you're, you're in trouble with Addison's disease. Correct. And you can check that out really by Sodium and potassium levels, yeah. and blood pressures that drop when you stand, yeah. and other other tests. Yeah, it's it's rare. It's Addison's it's really is, rare. is rare. I've never seen it. How many cases have you seen? Maybe five and five to ten. Yeah. And I've been practiced for about two years now. Two? Yeah. Uh, a little more than that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a rare condition. Now, what's not rare? Yes. Is when people are, are placed on prednisone for a long time period. If you've been on prednisone for something for more than three weeks, you cannot stop it like, like that, that because that Then can, you have an Addison's disease equivalent. You don't have the adrenals. Because uh, the adrenals have gone to sleep. Yeah. So you have, at that point, if it's over three weeks, then you have to take your time and you have to gradually taper it back and it can be very difficult. Do you see why I love this uh, topic? Because it is so interesting, it's complicated, it makes your brain work, it's great fun. Uh, a, a South Dakota man has pancreatic cancer, is taking chemotherapy and gets very dehydrated. He constantly has to go to the clinic to get fluids. How do you know when you're dehydrated or getting dehydrated? 
Now, that's a very interesting question. Uh, and I know of uh, people who do that, to come in for fluid uh, burst, for a variety of other illnesses. But do you, do you do that? Do you see that? Well, typically, that's not what I see. Um, I, I do see people with, with pancreatic cancer, and it's a bad disease, and it's very unfortunate. Now, there are different types of pancreatic cancer. There's the typical uh, t uh, pancreatic cancer, and then there's an endocrine pancreatic cancer, which has a much, much milder course as far as how long people live. It's a bad disease, though. Uh, now, if people come in and they've been throwing up, they've been having a lot of diarrhea, they have difficulty when they stand up of getting uh, lightheaded. Odds are that they're dehydrated. Right, and, and you, you give them fluids. You give them fluids. All right. A woman from Faith has uh, thinning eyebrows and is losing hair. Can that be caused by low thyroid, high thyroid, or what can you do? So what do you think this is? This is an interesting story. Thinning eyebrows, losing hair. Well, eyebrows... I, I don't know the data on that. Um, if someone has a concern about hair loss in general, I'll check. Uh, I'll check a TSH. Yeah, thyroid for sure. Yeah, but if uh, if they're a woman, I will also be concerned about their ov ovary function, uh, testosterone. Uh, levels? Testosterone level. I will check a, a, what's called DHEAS for the adrenal, and uh, and be aware that there are other things that can cause hair loss. Right. It, there are even immune systems like the you, we talked about the immune system turning against the thyroid or turning against the adrenal gland. It can turn against the skin and the hair, and people uh, yeah. lose hair because of that. And you could, you could have a change in skin color called vitiligo, where you have a white patch. Which, and it'll be, uh, you have a little white patch over here. If you have a vitiligo, you also have a little white patch on the other side. I mean, maybe, it's maybe not. most of the time it's symmetrical. Uh, vitiligo, and that's an immune system. Of course, of course. Of course, Dr. Oppenheimer. Sometimes one problem may be worse by an additional problem. Well, I started having what turned out to be symptoms of this condition probably three to four years prior to diagnosis. Um, blood pressure would go up significantly, but the most um, alarming wa uh, was I would have night sweats where I would sweat through my pajamas and actually the sheets and the bed. Uh, I'd have to get up at night and drink significant amount of water. But this wouldn't happen all the time. It, would, it was not every night. It was sort of on a just a irregular basis. Of the disease that was finally determined is a condition known as pheochromocytoma which is a very fancy name for a non-cancerous tumor of the adrenal gland, which is a gland that's responsible for uh, producing chemicals in the body that help to regulate heart rate and blood pressure. The only way to treat the condition is to have that tumor removed. And uh, I underwent surgery in March of 2007, had the tumor removed. It's very uncommon. Um, I, I understand about 1 in 50,000 people are diagnosed with this condition. Now there's probably more that have it, but only about 1 in 50,000 are ever truly diagnosed with this condition. And uh, one afternoon a, um, a physician, a nephrologist, uh, was called in to to see what his opinion was. And he and I got into a conversation and he finally decided to diagnose or diagnose to prescribe a medication uh, to give me at bedtime that night to see if that would have any effect on, the, uh, on the, his blood pressure and it worked. I've also been diagnosed with hypothyroidism which was probably uh, secondary to, these, to the tumor. Um, these chemicals not only that are excreted or secreted in the, by the adrenal gland not only affect the, the, the vascular, the heart and the blood vessels, but it can also affect the, uh, uh, the thyroid gland. I think a lot of these conditions, what I understand, they are undiagnosed because 
it's not an easy disease to condition to, to diagnose. It takes some expertise to discover what the underlying cause is. That was a great case. And, uh, you know, he had hypothyroidism, but he also had a pheochromocytoma, which is one of those deals that'll cause sky-high blood pressures that drop when you, when you stand up quickly, and palpitations, headaches, sweating. That's the classic triad of pheos. And I've made the diagnosis of two pheos in my lifetime. Uh, and one was when I was teaching at Emory in Atlanta, and it was on the, uh, one of the residents uh, came up with the case and so we did it together. What, what is your comment about pheo? I mean, it's, it's not a common condition. It's really rare. It's really rare. I mean, I see a lot of people with adrenal tumors and the number of pheos that I see, and so those are people that we know have a tumor on the adrenal gland. It could be, it could be a pheochromocytoma. You do certain tests that are fairly straightforward and sometimes they come back borderline. Usually, in a straight in a straightforward pheo, the numbers are off the wall. Yeah. And my grandmother could diagnose it. Yeah. Uh, there sometimes the numbers aren't off the wall, and they don't present with any. And you don't do those tests as a rule, and they don't present with the classic picture. Correct. What, what are these patients doing? Not coming with the classic picture. The you, nerve. The nerve of them. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and I know that if they go to surgery. Uh, and remove the tumor and you're not prepared that it is a pheo, then people can bottom out because they've been living with a pressure that has been pushed by this high level of adrenaline and then now all of a sudden the adrenaline's gone. So that you, we do know that that's a very important diagnosis to make early before surgery. Yes, and it's, and it's difficult and, pe and I'm sure I've missed them in my career. Yeah, very difficult. A woman from Sioux Falls says, my body is destroying T3. Since then, I have been taking glucothyronin, sodium, T3, 25 micrograms. It's from a compounded pharmacy. What are the dangers with this? What's your comment about that? See, some people get only T3 replacement, which is expensive, and so on. Where, where, where are you at with that? Uh, the, the only time I use T3 supplement, T3 replacement is, is if I'm trying to prepare someone for treatment for thyroid cancer. Okay. Because, and the reason why is because T3 has, well, uh, we talked about how long T4 can stay in the system. T3 has a very short half-life, so that's why you have to take it two to three times per day. Um, if, I, don't, I don't buy that that person has, it has a selective T3 problem. It's, it's, it's really not reported in the literature. There have been multiple studies in the literature that have compared T4 plus T3 versus T3 versus T4 alone. There's no advantage. And it's way less expensive just doing T4. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and there will be people who will, may disagree with all of this, but uh, you're giving it the best answer you have, and I'm agreeing with you. A man from Colton. Excellent judgment. I, that's what I always thought. A man from Colton had an accident in February and had a CT scan. The scan found a stage three tumor on his right kidney, which was removed along with the adrenal gland. How will that affect the hormones later down the road? Is he going to have trouble? Kidney's gone. Adrenal gland's gone. Is he going to have trouble without his one adrenal gland? Probably not. Okay. Why did they name it adrenal gland? Uh, it. Well, the old-fashioned name is a suprarenal gland. Is that what you're driving at? Yeah. Ad renal on top of the renal. Yeah. The suprarenal gland, yeah. the old name. Yep. Uh, renal meaning kidney. So it's that tumor that just kind of sits like a little yeah. top hat on the top of a And kidney. you could do very well without half your thyroid. You could do very well without a adrenal gland. You could do very well with just one kidney. He's not going to have one problem unless, well, it, you know. Uh, unless the other one goes bad. Then, you're, then, you have, then you have to see me. There you go. And if I don't have an adrenal gland, and some people don't because mm -hmm. they have Addison's disease and mm -hmm. they've killed both adrenal glands, mm -hmm. what would you replace my, me with? I typically would replace uh, with, with either prednisone or hydrocortisone. 
That's, uh, that's, that's that cortisone replacement. Yeah, yeah. that's the, what's called glucocorticoids. And then for the mineral corticoid, the aldosterone that you were talking about before, then you use something called Fluorineth. Okay. A woman from, so and it's, and it's, it's an adrenaline, kind of like. And the key thing with Addison's disease, uh, or if someone has, a, has not been on long-term prednisone, is if someone gets sick, then you probably need to double the dose of your replacements for the prednisone or the hydrocortisone. Right because of sickness, because your body cannot uh, take up for the extra stress. Now, I'm, uh, I'm a person, you're gonna balk on that, you're gonna say you're wrong, home. But you're wrong. Okay, <laughs> but I have an older patient, 50, I mean, 80, 90 years of age. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking that they are just, by nature, adrenal insufficient, just by the way they look. They come in sick as heck. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll kick in a little bit of, of uh, steroid. Uh, to cover them for adrenal insufficiency. How often do you do that? <laughs> um, if some, Let's say someone comes in and they're really, really in bad shape. They've got low blood pressure. They're, they're dying. Yeah. And so what I do typically then is I will draw a cortisol level and just send it off to the lab and then replace without waiting for the result. Bingo. A woman from Wilmot asked, can you talk about reactive hypoglycemia? What is it and how it affects? Now, we need to have short answers because we've got a bunch of questions and we'd like to run through them. What is reactive hypoglycemia? That's, and you could go all day on this one. Yeah. Shortly. Shortly. It's, uh, there, there's questions about whether it exists. And a lot of people say they're hypoglycemic. Normal women can have, uh, can have blood sugars fasting down to, in the upper 40s and have absolutely no symptoms. Um, the, there is a, a test called the glucose tolerance test, which is often done, which is, it involves uh, drinking uh, some, something like soda pop and looking for the sugar results. It's a totally yeah. unreliable test. It's, it's not a good diagnosis. And if there's a question about it, should see a, see a real good doc. But I'll tell you this, in my opinion, uh -huh. there are people who bottom out periodically when they haven't been eating well or they've been over-exercising. And uh, it's probably not the sugar. Might be something else, but uh, they need to eat and have some volume. And uh, but there is a real deal there. Whatever the cause is not I, clear. I challenge you to find a patient with a real low sugar in those in those scenarios. Okay, but there is real scenarios that occur like that. Whatever the cause may be, but it, it may not be no. hypoglycemia. That's my answer. I say in the same. Okay, good, good, good. We got, we're going to yeah, go along we'll, on that. We'll, we'll get through this. Why do Cheerios, oatmeal, and other cereals spike blood sugar in the morning? The carbohydrates. I mean, so if you're having more carbohydrates, that will raise the blood sugar. Uh, uh, the proper treatment for di for people who are ho overweight with diabetes is low lower carbohydrates. No, is is lower calories, weight loss. Lower calories. Lower calories. I don't care if someone's on a high carb, low carb, or medium carb diet. There's been it's been well studied. There's no difference. But if someone loses weight, they're going to do better. But it's almost impossible to lose lose and maintain weight loss. Ninety five percent of people cannot do that. Now you're you're a kind of a heavier guy. Yeah, thanks a lot. Well, I'm not <laughs> <laughs> then an endocrinologist. Correct. Uh, and so uh, I, my contention has been since ninety five percent or more cannot maintain weight loss, that okay, live with your body, love your body, be what you are, but stay active physically. Are you staying active physically? You Mark? bet. So how much do you do? I exercise between three and four hours aerobic per week. And on top of that, I do weights. And when I do weights, I do the aerobic part first, so I've gotten my heart rate up, and then I do the weights for another 20 or 30 minutes to maintain it. You walk the walk, good man. That's what I so, do. So and so and and, and I've been are, doing it for years. You're my hero. Um, have the doctors ever heard of elevated thyroid problems in children on the prairie who were born in the 40s and 50s and were caused by nuclear testing in New Mexico and the prevailing winds carrying radioactive material up from the plains? I've not heard that. I've now, never heard that. Now, now people can get bumps on their thyroid as if with exposure right, right, right. to radioactivity. Yes. Uh, there's, uh, of those people who have bumps, they're no more likely to have cancer than, than people who haven't been exposed. Okay. But it's, it's just, it's a risk factor. But as far as that causing thyroid abnormalities, no.
Now I know that not uh, functional. One of the problems that they say if you get a lot of exposure is you give them iodine. It turns off the thyroid, protects the thyroid from the radioactive material going to the thyroid. Yeah. But you're not going to say much about that. Well, it's it's beyond my level. All right. A woman in Pierre had a father who experienced terrible headaches all his life. Doctor at the time checked parathyroid glands, found tumor, and removed it. He never had a headache after that. Why would this tumor cause headaches? So, what is the parathyroid glands? Glands. There are four parathyroids. If someone has, the, if you have an overactive parathyroid, then quickly, you, then you can have. They can run around. <laughs> Uh, then you can your calcium level in the device can go high. So it's a calcium balancing. Correct. Tumor. And they are these little buttons on the back side of the thyroid. Correct. So you got to be careful when you're cutting on the thyroid. Correct. Sometimes you take those and you implant them in the forearm. It usually doesn't take. Really? Yeah. I've seen it work. Well, good. At the Mayo Clinic. Uh, well, they do everything. They do everything. <laughs> okay. A woman in Sioux Falls has a cousin who experiences hemorrhage in his tongue. Is this? Is this? Uh, Concerning. That's interesting. I, 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 is not that, my field. Not your field. And the answer is, be careful uh, your th whether your uh, your platelets are good or whether you you have a bleeding tendency. It's not usual to have a significant hemorrhage in the tongue, so that should be looked into. Woman from now, now there's one now there's one endocrinopathy where you could have big tongues. You know what that is? Hypothyroid. No. What? Acromegaly. Oh, that's right. That's a pituitary. Making too much growth hormone. Correct. All right. Well, one last question. A woman from De Delmont has a stone lodged in her gallbladder. What determines if it can be removed microscopically or surgically? Not in my field. I'll let you address it. Okay, that. and the answer is not in my field either. But, but well, and that's the question of uh, whether, you know, you ask your surgeon, and it depends upon the size, so on. Most of the time, you can do it with the laparoscope. I'd like to say one thing. What's that? Medicine is really complicated. Ten seconds. And uh, it, no one knows everything. And so that's why team approach is extremely important. If a doctor doesn't know the answer, then you may need to ask them, do you need help? Yep. And there's no, nothing embarrassing about referring on to somebody else yep. and trying to get right. an answer. So thank you very much, Mark. And oh, the one question about pancreatic removal by, my, uh, my, uh, by microscope, you can do that too, but there's a lot of different ways. And now for the winner of tonight's Prairie Doc quiz question. Multiple choice, the pancreas has two functions. One, makes digestive juices, yes? Yes. Two, makes hormones like insulin? Yes. Pancreas uh, d distributes cortisone to the joints? No. No, so the answer is five. Seven. <laughs> Number one and two, and the answer is five. It was Donna Wolf from Selby, South Dakota, who answered the question correctly. Thank you, Donna, for participating. And a book will be in the mail to you soon. We'll be right back after this. Because you don't want to miss out on the little things. Because you want to be there for life's important milestones. There are many reasons to get life-saving cancer screenings. More than 4,000 women die each year from cervical cancer. But regular screenings can prevent this cancer and catch it early. Do it for the people you love. Promise? Promise. 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 Make the promise to get screened. For more information about life-saving screenings or available financial assistance, visit GetScreenedSD.org. Some people may be offended by considering issues of sexuality, but sexual health is an important medical topic. Here are my opinions of available medical scientific data and ethical rules about sexuality. If what follows runs counter to your beliefs, please don't be hurt or offended. Instead, let it be a springboard for discussion. Sexual function is necessary for our species to survive, and it's a good and natural thing, but there's more to it than that. Sexual activity, as well as any non-sexual social friendship, promotes emotional connections which improve families and societies. Every relationship and communication, sexual or not, is fraught with vulnerability, miscommunication, and risk. Because of the tremendous value of human relationships, every effort should be made to play fair, follow rules, and avoid betraying an agreed-upon trust. 
Scientific and anthropological data across cultures show heterosexuality and homosexuality, LGBTQ, are defined by prenatal chemistry, hormonal, physiological, and genetic causes. The human sexual draw one has toward another is not a choice, but a consequence of powerful, complex, internal messages. Although sexual interest may not be a controllable choice, actions that would disgrace or dishonor another are chosen. Psychologists point out that people who discredit another for differences in race, age, culture, economic status, or sexual orientation are not only choosing to harm others and societal advancement, they are more destructively harming themselves. Hate is most poisonous to the one who harbors it. Medical ethical rules about sexuality work for non-sexual relationships too. First, be kind and considerate of your partner. Listen to them. Secondly, don't do harm. Being hurtful with a sexual act or otherwise when it betrays a mutual agreed upon trust, spreads unhappiness to the harmed and the hurter. Never put your partner at risk of disease and don't harm yourself or others by avoiding precautions. Seek regular health care and every sexually active person should be regularly checked for AIDS and other sexually transmitted infections. Third, be honest. Determine what is expected before any relationship of any kind. If it involves a promise to have no other sexual partners, then don't betray that trust. However, it is not fair to expect a sexual partner to avoid having other non-sexual friends of the same or opposite sex. Finally, respect your partner or friend's choices. Never force sex or try to control any other person's choices. This is called abuse and should not be tolerated. An abused person should always call for help. A sexual relationship, like a friendship, is built on kindness, trust, and respect for choices. A big thank you to our guest endocrinologist, Dr. Mark Oppenheimer, for coming to our studio in the Jaeger Media Center on the campus of South Dakota State University. His experience and knowledge helped immensely in our discussion tonight. Well, that does it for tonight, Mark. From all of us here at On Call with the Prairie Doc, until next time, stay healthy out there, people. an episode full of heart. It beeps about 70 times a minute and pumps about one-third cup each time or 2,000 gallons every day. Cardiology issues, next time on Call with the Prairie Doc. Major funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc has been provided by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call Television as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the medical quality improvement organization for South Dakota.
and the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions. Brookings Health System, Ophthalmology Limited, American Academy of Family Physician Foundation, and South Dakota Academy of Family Physicians. Avera Heart Hospital, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, CoBank, Fishback Financial Corporation, Vance Thompson Vision, Aberdeen District Medical Society, the Black Hills Medical Society, 3rd District Medical Society, Brookings, Madison, and Flandreau, Dakota Bank, Orthopedic Institute, Physicians Care Sanford Clinic Community Service Committee, and Swiftel Communication.